In a world where high-performance zero-defect buildings are hard to find, two men are on a mission to disrupt the status quo. Welcome to the Enifis Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work perspective on the adjacent possible and challenges to the status quo. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I'm Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator here with my colleague and always an official agitator, friend and Yoda, most everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, sir, Yoda. Hello, sir, Yoda. Today's guest mantra is about creating a sustainable advantage by adopting lean strategies to deliver green performance. He's a professional engineer and an MBA, most always a deadly combination. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Mr. Murray Guy. Thank you for having me. You're the uh, CEO of three companies, like as if you didn't have enough time to do with one company, he decided to jump in with three, Integrated Designs, Inc., EcoSmart Developments, and Shift to Lean. And through your work, you've been able to demonstrate that the living building challenge, net zero, legal projects, and I'm sure other ones can be delivered at no additional cost. Adam, and I love that story. Obviously, your career path has uh, coincided with a market opportunity. There is a story there to tell. So what's yours? I guess it all began. I'll start the story when I was working at the Saskatchewan Energy Conservation Development Authority, and it was a think tank for how to create a sustainable future for Saskatchewan. And it, it was a short term there, but my job was to put together a technical library. And that's where I discovered Amory Lovins and eSource. And uh, I just got a, a little strategic issues paper called Energy Efficient Buildings, Institutional Barriers and Opportunities. I don't let this thing out of my sight. It, it became, <laughs> you know, it, it be, I, I didn't know about integrated design before I came out of the energy efficiency world and started reading this stuff about pulling together integrated teams. And I just fell in love with that stuff. And so I actually went and did my, when I did my MBA, I used three classes to develop the business plan for integrated designs based upon fixing the barriers as in, you know, getting teams together, integrated design, that hence the name of my company, and commissioning. Well, you know, a big part of my business is to do commissioning. So that all came to fix those problems. And I was fortunate to go to work for Innovation Place Research Park for a, a character called Doug Tasted. That basically the first day of my job was make me money, not build me green buildings. And he wasn't going to change our budgets. And so we needed <laughs> to be able to deliver green on traditional budgets, hence the, you know, tunneling through the cost barriers to deliver high performance at less cost became the, the modus of operation. So, yeah. so I could keep going and going. I'm not sure how long, but you know, the first project was triple glazed windows, best money, the curtain wall, Conier 5550 curtain wall with thermal breaks. And it was the first building we did without having to need perimeter radiation and heat. Right. You know, and it was like, and, and it, the, oh. art, the engineer even showed that as future because they didn't trust that our envelope that we put on, you know, thermography and made sure that it was very tight would stand to be so good that we wouldn't need to put a supplementary heater on the perimeter. So it began there and three lead gold buildings projects later, nobody changing budgets. We learned how to do green on okay, no additional so cost. Just a couple of things. One, you've already gone into heresy territory here with no <laughs> premises heating. But two, for our international audience, can you describe to people the range of temperatures you deal with in Saskatchewan when you're designing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Because it, it the, the, yeah. So on the heating side, you know, it's we hit minus forty five and wind chills <laughs> yeah. below. But you know that the crazy part about our summers is that we also hit plus 40 and we have solar gain like crazy. And I, I didn't mention all the glass that we put in that first integrated design solution was spectrally selective because we need the light to come in and not the heat because otherwise we have to pay a whole bunch of money for the capital cost for cooling equipment, even though we only need it for 10 or 15 days of the year. 
So we need yeah. trees and we need shading so that we don't we get rid of that huge capital investment on cooling because we have to deal with that extreme as well. Yeah, it's it's very hard for people because when people think of Canada, well, first thing they think we all live in igloos and eat beaver. Then two, there's the whole <laughs> climate <laughs> zone range in Canada, and Saskatchewan has some of the most extreme. I mean, that's well, what Murray was talking about. There was minus forty degrees C and plus forty degrees C. That is a massive range for a building to deal with and remain resilient and perform persistently. Right, that that's some unique challenges there. All right, so. Vision Wall. Do you remember Vision Wall out of Edmonton, Murray? You, bet. you know, I, I've researched all of those technologies. Yeah, and I, I looked at that at the, about the same time as we did the 116 project, whether yeah. it would be on ear or Vision Wall. And I don't. And I'm trying to remember. He was the Ashray president, and I'm and I for whatever reason. Well, because I'm getting old, I'm forgetting these details. But I remember I was living in Edmonton at the time where Vision Wall was manufactured. And one of the high rises was going up and we were bidding on that project and the engineer had didn't spec any perimeter heating and all of the heating systems were electric. Now, think about that. Right. So this is probably going back to like 1989, 1991, something like that. Yeah. All electric building in Edmonton, Alberta, no perimeter heating. And um, and I was just a young I was only been out of school like six or seven years. I was scratching my head. For a long, long time over that one, but it had, you know, when you get that enclosure fixed, the loads go down, the comfort goes up, and you know what? The electric system made a lot of sense. There was no load in the building. Very simple. No load, so the economics can be there. Yeah. You also brought up Emory Lovins, and one of the famous books he wrote, of course, was Natural Capitalism. I don't know if either of you guys have read that book, but it's a... It's it's either here or downstairs. (laughs) (laughs) It's a classic, and... You know, he was in that book there, for those that aren't familiar, you really should get the book. I mean, it's timeless. The the message is in there. And one of the messages that that he talks about is that, you know, we can put in all of this high efficiency equipment, for example, I'll just give you an example, right? But if the raw materials for that equipment was, you know, comes from Europe, right? And then it gets made into parts at various plants around the world. And then those parts are then assembled in some manufacturing plant. It gets put into a warehouse. It gets shipped to the rail yards. It gets then onto a ship. It comes over to the North American coastline, right? Gets on another train, goes to another major distribution warehouse, right? Goes to the sub warehouses. Then it goes to the distribu- the actual local warehouse. And then some contractor buys that piece of equipment. And then for the next Two years, he drives back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to the job site, to his house, to the you know the supplier, back again. It doesn't matter how efficient that piece of equipment is. We've destroyed all of the efficiency in the process of getting it into that job. You know, and there a very similar, a good example of that was back at Innovation Place, we had a lot of labs and we were using marmoleum, very energy intensive product manufactured in Britain. And by the time you took that all into account, there was a software called Bees that basically did the analysis. And who would think that VCT tile is way more sustainable than marmoleum? But, you know, (laughs) marmoleum is made out of linseed oil and all these healthy things. But when you took into account all that you talked about, it was a VCT tile was way more sustainable. (laughs) Now, that's interesting because, again, a lot of people do not take into account the hidden costs, right? Sustainability is all about where you draw the border. Right. So yeah. if you draw it three foot round your job, yeah, buy all the, knock yourself out, right? Get the bamboo this, the memory and that. But if you really <laughs> take into account supply chain and life cycle costing, that whole equation flips, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you really are a sustainable Taliban member, let's say, you know, <laughs> you've got to think about all that and then convince the psychopath developer of this, right? So good luck. But seriously, though, there is a – an iceberg effect here, right? And if you are not lazy and do the deep thinking, then you have to think like that. You start thinking about where it comes from. And this is where my love-hate relationship with lead moves into the love zone because they they think about that. They talk about that. They talk about resourcing locally. So yeah. kudos for them for that, right? You bet. So, Murray, I mean, you've built a career on this whole principle. Lean is not new. You know, I mean, it's lean... 
lean processes. I mean, Deming was a was the master of lean, right? Shipped yeah. it over to Japan, made the Americans look like fools, and the Americans brought them back again. <laughs> so you know the whole concept of. But you've taken this into the construction world. Yeah, what motivated. I, you? I think yeah. it would help to explain how I jumped to lean. Yeah, integrated design. Because yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, because it's a the sixth building for innovation place was the first lead project in Saskatchewan. So I took told that same boss that said, make me money, don't build me green buildings, but I'll, if you want to do green and make me look like a leader, go right ahead. So I <laughs> promised him lead gold building at no additional cost. And it was just, you know, getting pretty good at this integrated design. And so we, we go to tender a $7.5 million, 80,000 square foot building up in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Drum roll, please. We we open up the tender documents, 9.5, it was 2.2, in 9.7 million on, and I'm expecting a 7.5 number. And so, <laughs> so, and this was just before I was going to take my whole family to Australia for the summer while they <laughs> put files in the ground. Talk about stress. So, <laughs> Two days later, I assembled the, the contractor that had built the last project for us. He lines up all the line items, finds out that the structure is $2.2 million out, comes in and fixes it with the team. And we delivered the project with a $100,000 contingency, lead gold, 55% less energy by fixing the, pulling out the wood structure and putting in concrete. And that's where I swore I would never do another project without having the value of the contractors involved and delivering a project with a, a lead gold, 55% and less energy efficient building with a $100,000 contingency because I had no more contingency left. We needed every set to build this building and they delivered it for that. It was so it was amazing. So that got me into, we thought it was, we had created this lean project delivery thing. We said, oh, we're integrated design. Let's call it integrated project delivery. We did a search and found out that there's a whole industry that has gone, taken the Deming philosophy, Toyota, and made a lean construction institute that has adopted the manufacturing principles for construction. So yeah. just to put a pin in something you said there, I'm putting in my chart surveyor's hat now. What you're also demonstrating there is the power and value of an itemized, a line-by-line tender return. So I've been in your shoes where you open the tenders and in Western Canada, some of them just give you a number. Thanks very much. Here's a number. Do you want the job or not? <laughs> you know? Right. No, you, you need to see you all the line items because they all add up to some kind of yeah. value that the owner needs to make decisions on. So, yeah. I've seen some contractors absolutely flat refuse to do that. They want to give you a number and shake your hand and walk away, which I always advise clients never to accept. Yeah. But, you know, the, the a big takeaway from that example is you've got to get line items into your tender returns as a compulsory yeah. item. Or, or better yet, yeah. yeah. I think one of the yeah. things about lean is that you don't want to have to tender. You, you basically go right. and assemble the best team with the understanding that you're going to operate in a spirit of trust and transparency and collaboration to deliver best value in less time at less cost, everybody wins. Yeah. And so the biggest yeah. barrier in the market right now is the perceived, the perception that that's not a competitive process. But we, you know, if the three of us were going to select somebody, they're going to have an issue, they're going to come back to us with a for our request for qualifications and they're going to, they're going to have references and they're going to have a expected profit margin and we're going to interview them and we're going to put them, we're going to put a scorecard and mark them and we're going to select the best person. We just have the final price yet. So. All right, so we're 14 minutes in and I'm triggered. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so yeah, this yeah. is, this is, you, you've, you've hit a hot button for me because as you said, the competitive, tender pro- the, the competitive tender process does not recognize value, only recognize cost, right. right? And this, the process you're talking about is really venturing into construction management land where you extreme pre-qualify. That's right. right. And you identify the experts in whatever you're doing, and then you go with them and you, you negotiate, and then you embed the value into the job that way, right? Yeah. Now- I have lost my mind trying to describe this to some Canadian clients and I've frankly I've given up. You know, you just cannot get them out of the RFP game. And the delivery and the outcomes of that are horrific in some cases, right? So yeah. kudos to you for that. Now the other thing I wanted to to say was I did a bit of research because I am a nerd. 
and I typed in lean construction and there seems to be a lot of overlap or misunderstanding or even it's, it is real with Six Sigma and other buzzwords that are floating around at the moment. So is lean construction a fad or is it a real thing or is it borrowing or is it adjacent to something like lean construction and scrums and all these other buzzwords that are running around at the moment? The, the thing that comes to mind is I wrote an article, Lean, a three-pronged approach. It's all of that. You know, I started down the road of having to fix projects or broken buildings, busted budgets, and being in, in trauma. <laughs> and, and then that was enough of a motivation to get the owner to adopt this lean construction systems, the last planner system and target value delivery. But, you know, that's the systems that you use to get things done faster to a target cost with small contingency and create value. But I've actually come to realize that, you know, I, with a, in my own company, well, what about why don't, does an integrated designs want to make more money? And so it's the Lean Sigma stuff about eliminating waste and the eight wastes and, and from the bottom up that you need your own people to buy into flow and efficiency, creating workflow and efficiency. So that's the Sigma stuff. And then from the top down, Unless you have people willing to be explorers and change agents, it goes nowhere. Yeah. And, and so we need lean, top down, bottom up, and the systems that we use. Need, we need to have a common language that everybody can understand. And uh, so it's, it's all of what you had said. I like that. And I think the only way it really happens, particularly in Canada, where there seems a lot to be a lot of resistance to change, is it has to be driven by as a want, a bottom line want by the clients, right? So, you know, if you're working for a university or a big developer or a pension fund, they've got to say, right, boys, we're starting this job and this is how we're going to do it. Otherwise, it just zigzags to RFP and competitive bid and the, the lowest scumbag gets it, right? <laughs> yeah. And who wants the stress of opening up an envelope that's $2.2 million higher than, you know, there's, there's a better alternative. Yeah. And just to be, just to clarify that point as well, I mean, full charts of our mode here. If you have a cost consultant and you have proper market research and proper design team, you are not going to get that difference. You're going to go out to bid knowing within a, a plus or minus 10% of what that should come back at if people are not playing games. Yeah. And, you know, my and, old and thing was you need five good bids to get th five bidders to get three good bids, right? Yeah. And even every one of those bids will have 10% contingency in it. That's yeah. how you get. Because nobody right. has time to, they don't, it's not their design. They'd had no input into it. They, yeah. they have two weeks to price a job. There's, so, you can find 15% cost savings in just having conversations with people because of that risk factor. Because yeah. they, they tendered the job. Yeah, I'm a big fan of post-tender interviews and really getting into some of the nitty gritty and minuting that and making that part of the contract documents. Because that's where you see where the, the malarkey is going on, right? <laughs> yeah. So then the other thing that happens, how do you get going into the, you know, how much time do we waste at the front end of projects? You know, renderings and all these things that we can't afford, as opposed to when I went to see a master in that builds all the buildings, Jack, in Seattle for Amazon, his first meeting is about pool planning to get in the ground three months early, to buy three months on the front end, not to mention three in the middle and three at the end. Okay. So everything is driven to get the permit and in the ground and from day one, instead of wasting those precious summer months in, in our climate, you know? so Yeah, so again, this is why I'm a fan of construction management, because you can be piling and designing at the same time, right? <laughs> exactly. As long as you trust your team. Yep. to be able to get you to your target cost. Yeah. yeah. So that's all it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so where I came from in the UK, I used to work for a, a AAA developer and as a development manager. And we always, eight times out of 10, we went CM for that very reason. One, you can compress the design process without loss of quality. And two, if a tenant comes along or someone comes along, you've got the ability to shift and make changes at minimal cost and only directing the cost change to the people who really need to get involved in it, right? It's such right. a flexible thing, but you, the caveat to it is you must have professional development managers running the whole show. You can't be someone who's non-cog, say, 
Yeah. No, yeah. you do total owner involvement into making the calls yeah. on value. And the I, construction managers is the way I've delivered most lean projects. It's it's a little different in that you're, you know, construction, some construction management is assembling prices of sub trades, you know, whereas in this case, we want the construction manager to be a facilitator of determining the best value for the owner, yeah. more so than just assembler of what, because we need the innovation and the integration and the, yeah. the best practices. Yeah. yeah. So, but that all works. Lean applies to any project delivery model. You might have heard of integrated project delivery. That's just one where you have a different contract, shared risk and reward. And it's it, it, every, I, at first I thought, oh, that's the only lean project. But I prefer now to apply lean to any project model. Yeah, and it, again, so lean's a good concept, and it's a buzzword, unfortunately, right? Which people don't understand. It, you, you, I guess, you always find yourself defining it and explaining it, right? As you're on job. I can't even. I can't even talk about it in my own house. <laughs> I don't know what happened with lean in Saskatchewan in healthcare? The way it was rolled out. I have a lots of healthcare workers in my field that I don't even talk about lean in my house. <laughs> So I, I had uh, a colleague give me the best definition of co construction management I've ever heard and the best definition of lean I've ever heard. So his definition of construction management was, well, Adam, it's really just 32 trade contracts now together and a construction manager represents us, which I thought was pretty cool. And the other yeah. one was lean. He said, lean is uh, bullshit out value in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's about it. Yeah. So you know, I love it. People who can boil things down to a sentence, I love that. Yeah, you know, and, and still get the impact. So that guy was awesome. He shall remain yeah. nameless because he's still working. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know, one thing I, I, you know, the barriers of getting people to adopt lean. One of the things that U of W was the first project after the forestry center where they had a broken building budget, busted budget that they needed to fix. So what was a saving grace for them was that we assembled the team, told Sherman, it's the only way you're going to solve this $10 million budget gap. They had no more money, is that if the team doesn't come to the table and fix this $10 million gap, you're still free to tender because they, they just you select your team, they give you a design assist fee, and you still have the ability to get out. We didn't have to ditch anybody. Because it was such a, a tough challenge that you get this team thing going that you want the project to happen, but the owner still has a no. They can go tender it as a default, so why not start the right way? The Edifice Complex will continue in just a moment. If you're enjoying this podcast, we need your help. We're not asking for money, just a minute of your time. Our goal is to make the Edifice Complex podcast as relevant, educational, and useful as possible. By having good ratings, we can reach the widest audience. Therefore, our request is two small things. If you haven't already, leave us a review and rating on iTunes. And subscribe to the Edifice Complex on YouTube, even if you normally only listen to the audio version. These two things will help us immensely. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. Thanks for your time, and now, back to the show. The value of having a construction professional on board is really high. I mean, on the development management jobs I did, we always had one of the larger construction people, and we paid them a fee so that they could competitively bid Paid them a yeah. fee, a small fee, but they came and advised on like uh, numbers of cranes, truck movements, you know, traffic management around the site, and some of the the deeper concepts on the curtain wall and the way we wanted to lay the job out. We got that input in early, and that was valued right into the drawings before they went out to tender. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. but you got to pay yeah. those people. Yeah, and expect that work that value for nothing. No, no, you know? you've got to pay for it. If you don't pay yeah. for it, you're yeah. not getting it. It's as simple as yeah, that, I right? Agree. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, are both you guys familiar with the NRL building in Colorado, the RSM building? No. All right. So there, there's a project government owned. So the clients involved right from the, from the day one, they wanted to build a flagship building. That was a triple a real estate that uh, Murray talking to sort of talking to your story there that wasn't going to cost any more than a, you know, than a non high performance building or so that, and anyways, long story short was, is that, they built a team, just exactly like what you said, the and the big part of it was identifying expectations. 
that was that was a big part of that project. What were the expectations from everybody on the team? And that project came in ahead of schedule, below budget. The post occupancy evaluations took a little bit, a little tweaking in the building, but now they're they they exceed most buildings in the inventory buildings in the U.S. Yeah. So we we there are examples out there like the buildings that you've worked on, Murray, the the bigger ones. But I think one of the key things there is that the owner has to be involved. Yes. Yeah. And if you, the owner's not involved. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, and you and you said it right up front. Have, getting on the same page as to what defines value and the expectations yeah. is the first step. Because if yeah. you don't are starting to throw darts at multiple targets, everybody has their own perception of what's important. So yeah, I don't, it'd be interesting, you know, in ASHRAE guideline zero, the commissioning guy is responsible for design reviews according to the owner's project requirements. It's, a, it's kind of funny that it's a commissioning guy that has in the best interest of, I can't commission the design to see if it's going to perform as intended unless this is in place. And it's not usually in place. There is no <laughs> great OPR that sets the target. We don't yeah. even know what we're shooting at. Yeah. 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 yeah, if you're a developer and you don't give out a good design brief, then shame on you, and you should expect yeah. a bad outcome, right? Yeah. <laughs> you need to specify what's the value proposition, yeah. what's success criteria, and then get into what success criteria for the team too. They need to make money, get done early. Yeah. But- what's interesting here, what we're all talking about is a thing, I'm a big fan of the uh, book that came out a few years ago called Extreme Ownership. And it's, a, it's about a book about leadership, and it applies to military, but it also applies to everything, right? So what you get, what you're getting in the lean process, the construction management process, is an ownership formed by team bonding. You know, how do you get a team to perform? You put them together and make them do difficult stuff, right? And then there's an ownership and a fraternity that bonds around that job, right? Whereas if you mm-hmm. just go on a stone-cold RFP and a stone-cold tender, you don't get any of that. So then it becomes a game of minimum compliance. Yeah. Dog eat dog. Yeah, the soft issues really matter if you're trying to put together a complex high-end job, right? You're not making yeah. donuts here. <laughs> and we have the first thing we do on a lean project is go out for some event and hardly talk. The rule is that you're not supposed to talk about the project. Yeah. And you actually get that bond with people to get to see them as people so that when you can have the tough conversations with them and know that they're going to know that you're not a, I'm not an arsehole. You know? yeah. And, yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. exactly. It, it's so important. Well, you, know, you, know, you know, there's no arseholes in Saskatchewan. They're all out in the east, eh? Oh. They're, they're all in Toronto. <laughs> right? I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> yeah. Exception noted for Adam. Yeah, he's, yeah. The, he's the exception. I know. Yeah. I, I own my assholeness 100%. I'm all in with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that's why you need to get with your team where you can actually put fun like that, you know? Yeah. Get yeah. over it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so on the lean construction, going back to the lean construction thing, have you got any metrics on like lean delivers this saving or lean delivers this benefit? Have you got any sort of metrics that could stand a, a sort of okay. investigatory uh, poke? <laughs> great question. Because, you know, it's just about too good to be true. Yeah. You, you know, I, I'm not sure if you've heard that, that it, you know, but I, I've actually come to the conclusion that it's not the metrics that will sell anybody today to do a lean project. Right. You need to be a certain character. And I call them explorers wanting to make change and, and a difference in the industry. But the metrics are, and I just recently did a, a presentation to Sustainable Buildings Manitoba. And so I spent some time on this. All right, cool. So I, I asked, there's 50 people in the audience and I asked them, okay, remember the story about the forestry center? We found 7.5 million on a $7.5 million job. What does that represent? I think it was 16% or, or something like that. We found 7.5 million on a $38.5 million job, which was a U of W project. And so that, and that's just in the target, it's called target value design or target value delivery, just in the design process. So 16%. Hang on, on that so one I, then. So U of W, what's that? U, University of? University of Winnipeg. Of Winnipeg, okay. So. Yeah, and you needed to deliver a, a lab building that right. was uh, $38.5 million. It had a Bavarium, a greenhouse, 70% lab. We delivered lead gold, 59 point some percent less energy. 
with a contingency of less than 2%, and we were in the ground before we even had drawings. Now, that's a that's great example I, because that's a proper, yeah. complicated, high-end project, yeah, right? And out of a barium in it, at a greenhouse on the roof, and we were in the ground early, and we delivered it with less than a 2% contingency because we had such a great team. So going back to that, so that was a 16% saving just in the design process. Our listeners need to understand about Winnipeg. Winnipeg gets as cold as Fairbanks in the wintertime and as hot and humid as Florida in the summertime. It's one of the worst places in the world <laughs> or the best places in the world. Well, right? Yeah. That's what I call right. it, Winnipeg, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so yeah. And those, again, that aren't familiar with, with the province of Manitoba, Winnipeg is the capital. The national bird is a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> and they're big. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, phenomenal. That's just yeah. awesome. So um, I'll just finish off that metric again. Yeah. yeah. So there was a, a, one of the grandfathers of lean construction did a paper and he his number was 18%. And so we found, we validated that his number is true. So then the next thing I asked the audience was, how much does it cost to go to net zero? Five to 12% premium. <laughs> On a, a project right. is, is, is a, I forget which paper It's a recent paper that I went and the premium to get to net zero is five to 12%. So is 18% bigger than 12%? Yes, it is. <laughs> so and we should, if we get rid of all the waste in construction, we can build net zero buildings for no additional cost and put money in our genes besides. You engineers and your equations and numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, the problem is he's got an MBA too. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what that. <laughs> so you can if do it. Just a, if Murray was just an engineer, it would be okay. But when you put in the MBA, that's what that. Then it's all hell in a handbasket. Right. So let's let's just restate that. <laughs> let's restate that just for the impact, because what Murray's saying there is, if you use lean correctly from design to completion, there's a potential eighteen percent saving. Right, I get the waste oh. out of the design and construction process. Oh, wrong. That was just in the design phase. We haven't even talked about saving six months of construction time yet. Oh, right. So what's the number for construction then? Well, masters of the... That's why I said this is too good to be true. So masters have some have claimed 40% savings. So, but let's just leave it. Let's just leave it at twenty, just to make it more believable. <laughs> what? <laughs> it, it, no, that's how much waste we we only use. Ten percent of the, the effort goes into creating value in construction. Sixty percent in manufacturing. Right. The Moose Jaw Hospital documented their lean project. They hit forty-one percent. So, if you start doing the math of only ten percent turning into value in our current construction practice and get it up to 41%, the numbers are, are really big. So, yeah. so sorry to interrupt, back to you. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, but you know, Adam, it goes back to um, Steve Burrows, one of our other guests, yes. and he, he made the statement to us that 50% of the labor in a construction project is wasted. Or in other words, in two days of construction work, only one day actually goes into actually building the building. Yeah, and I think it's way worse than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it is worse than that. All right. And so just to, again, put that in even better perspective, my mind is a tad blown here. <laughs> Half my earphones are hanging off right now. <laughs> yeah. So there's a potential on a 38 million lab building. Let's be clear. Labs are not easy, right? <laughs> right. You can't rule a thumb that sucker, right? So there's a potential 18% saving in design phase. And with efficiencies in manufacturing, there's a potential, say, 40%. In construction, on yeah, the table, you're going to be a master. You're going to, you know, you're going to have an integrated project team that has done this a number of times using prefabrication, right. so, just in there we go. supply chain. Once you get all that stuff figured out, then you, will, you know, forty percent would be the the best person. All right, then. So let's let's take a pessimistic view. Let's say twenty percent. So there's eighteen yeah, percent on the table in design. Use, the other one sounds too good to be true. Yeah. All right. Let's say ten or ten or twenty percent on a thirty-eight million dollar building. That's a lot of cheddar, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then when you factor into the next part of the equation that a net zero building is potentially on the upside 
a premium of 12%, you're still net way better off, right? Yes. Okay, so let's, let's just absorb that for a minute. I'm now not in like a wise sage. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, why the hell are we not doing this? Uh, uh, <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was a belief. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's actually the, the, the talk to Sustainable Buildings Manitoba was kind of a reaching out to get lean camps together with green camps and have this conversation that we're having today. Why are we, with climate change and everybody, the challenges that the planet has, and I have a new grandchild that was just born this month, by the year 2100, when we've got 11 billion people here, I'm concerned about us. He's going to be 82 years old at 2100. We need to start this conversation and get on board that we can do this because we can't. Yeah, so there's there's so much inertia, right? It's the inertia and which is a natural resistance to change. But there's also the what's the saying? Julius Caesar said, you know, convincing convincing a man against something that you know involves him keeping his job is never going to work out for you, right? Yeah, a man will never a man will never learn a skill if, if it doesn't uh, improve his salary, right? Yeah, that's pretty much you, know, you get, they got blinders on, you know. Yeah. yeah. So it has to be, it has to be a top-down dictate from the client ultimately, right, to go this way. You know, well, either that or whenever I, I do lots of training and I, sometimes I, I think we're our own worst enemies by making it like it's going to be green or leaders that just maybe subliminally, you know what's good for biz, your own business to create teams and partnerships, just start, do it for the competitive advantage and your business opportunity and just and don't make a big deal of it. Just do it because it, it's you can make way more money as a contractor by being efficient and getting work to flow. Now, now, so just, uh, now you're talking my language. To yeah. say, oh, do it. Just this is the way we do business. Yeah. I remember I had sold a business. I had a business that was making prefabricated substations for district energy, cogen plants. And when the company bought us, it was a Danish company. They bought us and they and all of their facilities around the world were ISO 14001, 9001. And I didn't know anything about these standards. And I was I was the guy you guys are talking about in terms of resistance. Like, we, you don't need this crap. We were working fine the way it was before. Look at the profit that we had on the bottom line, blah, 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 blah. You know what? I was wrong. And I was arrogant and I was I was I was the bad man in that whole equation. And it wasn't until I started to see the benefits of these programs about how efficient the plant could run, the reduced waste, the ability to serve a client, like the turnaround time. It was, yeah, it was an eye opener. Yeah. But the, but the, the roadblock was in my mind, right? Yeah. It was my own biases. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting that a key part of lean is having to admit that we have problems because nobody wants to do that. <laughs> and you just sort of, you know, I, I was the problem, you know, and, yeah. and, and the, the, some of the best, the best presentation I saw at the Lean Construction Institute conference that we put on in Vancouver was how I failed at Lean. It was the best. Because <laughs> we, we all, yeah. Yeah, it is all about looking for problems and fixing problems. The problem here is the sunk cost fallacy, right? So if your whole career has been about doing it a certain way, and then you're challenged to do it another way that is demonstrably better, then you're in your mind, whether you know it or not, your mind's going, dude, we've just been doing it this way for 20 years. We're going to look really silly if we change this. You know, it's, yeah. this is why people don't sell shares that they buy when they tank because there's a right. sunk cost in it. And then the minute you do that, take that step to sell that share or move to a new construction method that completely supersedes your one, you're acknowledging a failure. And that yeah. failure represents the combined years you've been stuck in that mindset, right? So humility yeah. Yeah. is the key humility. to unlocking this, right? Yeah. yeah. That's some deep shit there. Excuse me. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you know, it's funny, Murray. Adam and I have talked about one point. At some point, we're going to do a show on owning and operating and selling businesses. Because yeah. we've, both, we've both done that. At some point, you're going to have to deal with your three assets that you're sitting there in the Top chair, right? Right, and I don't even know—is that even crossed your radar screen yet? It's funny that you should ask. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that because I'm actually in the process right now, so I can totally relate to realizing the value of your business. 
Yeah. yeah. So it, it, now, I'm in that process right now myself. So you know, when you think about take two businesses, let's take a business that's a competitor of yours, it, different model. You run yours in a lean method, low waste, high productivity, high quality, very fluent, very flexible. I mean, these are the things, the benefits that you get out of running a really good company, right? Compared to the other guys like Adam that you were talking about, stuck in their ways, don't want to change, yeah. don't admit failure. If I'm an oh, investor- oh. And top down, you know. And top, and top. Yeah. So this yeah. is God, oh, So this <laughs> now, you, now you got me on my soapbox because <laughs> we talked about. So both Adam and I ran, and I'm pretty sure Adam, we, we had this discussion. Really flat organizations. Yep. We never saw our, and, and the only time it became hierarchical is when we sold the company to the big international, right? Yep. Up until that point, we had a flat organization, and decisions happened in the field. You know, they didn't need always to come to us. We gave them autonomy, right? And why is because we hired those people. We hired on, we hired that, we hired people who were smarter than us, more passionate than us, more enthusiastic than us. And if they can't make those decisions, why the hell did we hire them? Yeah. <laughs> Just like Matt's story, get, 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 get out the door. <laughs> now, get yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, so the flat uh, that comment, yeah, that'll be that'll be on our conversation about flat organizational structures versus hierarchical and the failures that hierarchy creates. Yeah, and so that's all that last planner system is. You know, you maybe seen pictures of all of the people doing the work, the last planners up at a board because they know way more than the construction manager or the commissioning guy. Or they know what work needs to be done and they coordinate it to the milestones in some master schedule and they commit to getting that work done. Simple as that. It's a bottom up respecting the workers to come together to do deliver on their promises to get the work done. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay. Flat and the people doing the work do the planning. Yeah. yeah. yeah going, Beautiful. Going back to the ownership thing, I always live in hope and mostly die in vain at the moment of a, <laughs> of a truly integrated design and build firm. Now, I don't mean design and build in the bullshit way where they just sub out the design like it's that they're buying bricks. 99.9% .9 of design and build jobs are complete and utter BS because all they're doing is a contractual arrangement. It's yeah. horizontal, not vertical, right? Including all you P3 bunnies out there, so please be triggered right now. <laughs> However, there is such a thing as a truly integrated design firm, and it maybe has to start a small scale and residential where the design team are proper employees of the construction firm. They work directly for the construction firm. The construction firm pays them monthly and sends their taxes to Oswa, just like a normal employee, right? They're not yeah. an outsourced subcontract or an outsourced firm. That construction firm has PI insurance and they own that design. This is why I call the Apple model, not because I'm an Apple fanboy, which I am, but Apple own that device and every experience that comes out of it, right? Whereas, say, the Windows Dell duopoly, where Microsoft does the design and they hand it off to Dell to do the hardware, which is like, I don't know, you know, Stantec doing the design and PCL doing the construction, right? That's the analogy yeah, there. Exactly, yeah. Right? And so, you know, Jack from Selling Construction, who I talked about in Seattle, that he builds 43 stories for Amazon. Right. Just the way you're talking about their design team is not responsible for drawings. Their design team is responsible for meeting the owner's project requirement. And then they, they take it to a certain stage and the contractor or the constructor and his team yeah. take over designing and building the shop drawings, basically, yeah. from the conceptual state they're so successful that they don't bid any work jack i call him master jack he's retired now they basically handed him project as fast as he could deliver because they were so they had such an integrated project to lean that they delivered best value on time on schedule to target cost and he owned it's, it right he owned that they, sucker they yeah owned, here another yeah. 43 story tower for you can you get her done yes we can or, or they would say, no, we can't because we got this other one we got to do for you. So, they, yeah. And, and that's how they did it with just amazing teams. And, you know, I took a – we were coaching a team in Vancouver or Victoria. I took them down to see Jack. And it's interesting that we had a guy that had all the lean words and he was talking to Jack's team about all the, the buzzwords, Gemba and this. And, and they're sort of looking at him. They don't know the, they, they don't know how lean they are. It's just in their blood. They just yeah. do it. 
I always thought it was, oh, let's have a supermarket on the every fourth floor to store our materials so that we don't have to go down one or up one. And, and that's called a supermarket. Jack's beyond that. He's just like, why would we ever do that? The, their hoisting system is the stuff that's getting put in that day gets delivered to the site, to the spot for that week's worth of work. Nothing else is allowed on right. site. See, again, it, you've hit another whole button there. Call it tack zones. They had their main floor rooms locked off. You could you could move into them. They were clean. They weren't even topped off on the 43rd story yet. And everything, every trade had its week's worth of work. No, Nothing on the floor, completely clean. It was just like, it was a symphony of construction. Oh, again, I love that. you've hit the soft spot for me there because, you know, what you're talking about there is because they own it and they haven't subcontracted it out and, and absolved their responsibility and ownership for it, because they own it, they are doing essentially operating like a manufacturer where they're optimizing all their processes, their just-in-time materials and delivery, their site housekeeping. For me, when I walk on a site, their site housekeeping tells me everything I need to know about how good or bad that contractor is. Yeah. It takes me two minutes to know what a deal how is going on. How they yeah. are and uh, yeah. Yeah. How efficient is it moving this shit around and trying to get a ladder up when there's stuff in the way? No, it doesn't work. So this well, is, there's a relationship yeah. to the, the job site hygiene. And I mean the hygiene and about ladders and materials yeah. in the way and, and traffic flow and health and safety. Yep. You know? Yeah. These sites are safer sites. Yeah. So it's a, safety is a byproduct. Right. I, yeah. I always thought that uh, with the advent of P3 or PF5 from the UK in Ontario, with Infrastructure Ontario, I always thought someone like Ellis Donald PCL would buy a design team and really go at it like in a proper vertically integrated way, but not happened, right? Because no. it's like the scorpion and the frog. You are horizontal. <laughs> you will always be horizontal. And I yeah. will always be what I am, which is not a construction firm. I am a contract management firm. I devolve all my responsibilities as far down the chain as possible and everything can go whistle from there. Now, that is a business approach that works for them, clearly, because, you know, PCL and Aston are beasts and they deliver, right? They're not bad firms. But yeah. the change you're talking about has to come with true vertical integration and ownership, right? Yeah. And you can't just do it for one project. It's got to be your way of doing business. It's got to be else a culture. It, it's, then yeah. it's not sustainable because you, 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 it's too easy to revert back to the old way unless it becomes part of your culture. So, so let's, yeah. let's talk about residential because most of my experience, I avoid residential like the plague in my career. Right. So yeah. I, one of your businesses here, I'm looking at the website now, the EcoSmart thing, right? There's a, there's a, the front page has a couple of lovely uh, sort of townhouses i suppose but in a contemporary sort of ball house design and yeah. i guess they're super energy efficient now i think that what you're describing there's a way bigger chance for this to be implemented and and achieved in the residential market yes and we we use lean for eco smart to right. our goal is to build net zero homes at market prices so that they're not a premium so those two houses that you're looking at yeah Interesting that the one on the right is double wall construction with blowing in cellulose. It's net zero ready because right. my, my son built the one on the right. The one on the left is they, they both got triple glazed windows in it. But the one on the left is more of a market type home, two by six construction, decent insulation. But because he didn't go with the integrated condensing boiler that allowed a suite in the basement to be off of one system, he ended up having a furnace in his basement and bulkheads and, and a bunch of stuff that chewed up valuable headspace. You know what? The price of both those houses are about the same. You know, they're both great houses, but one's net zero ready and one's a good quality build, but they were the same price. So the, the lean, different thinking of the systems found savings. The lumber package was only twenty. Three hundred dollars premium. We made it up in other kinds of savings. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you, I would be very happy with that house on the right. A bit bigger, maybe two thousand square foot ish. That would be perfect for me in the next phase of my life. And a triple yeah. standalone garage with all my toys in, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, our first net double wall construction was a blue heron house. Just so that if you want to go check out a really cool website, Kent and Darcy, young professional couple, didn't quite hit net zero, but analyzed the hell of it. They got it to be 0.58 air changes. Passive house is 0.6. Right. 
Right. A very good build, and he, he documented there's lots of really good data there. Blue Heron House, H-A-U-S, Haas. Mm, yeah, oh, yeah, it's in Hoof House. <laughs> yeah, 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 in Passive House, Germany, yeah. kind of thing, yeah, yeah. So for our, our listeners, you know, my personal view is we've all been, particularly us baby boomers, we've all been hypnotized. A house is an asset. It's not. Assets make you money. They don't cost you money, right? And we've all... The way it is in, certainly in the Western countries I've lived in, you know, you can build any dog shit and sell it. And I think that's going to change. Demographics are going to change that. Yeah. And if I was a resi- in the residential construction business, I would be positioning my business to build cheap, to build efficient. And there's no reason why that has to compromise comfort or aesthetic in my view, right? Yeah. And you can mass produce that. You can prefab that, right? That's where I think the... If I was going to start another business again, which I'm not going to, but if I was, it would be in that field because that's where I think there's, it's really on the tip of a change, I believe. Yeah. Had, had, do you see and, that happening in Saskatchewan? We need a banker, or, a, you know, some green, because, you know, it, the whole industry, when you're trying to get your cash flow and your money going, you got to spend more money on the envelope. Well, they don't give you the release of the funds to match. Right. When real estate comes in to value your property, they're not, I've got $25,000 worth of panels on my roof here. That doesn't, it's not granite countertop. So the industry <laughs> isn't helping us any <laughs> yeah. to, to see the value. Or, yeah, lots, or of, lots of gates we got to open up to make this thing flow. Yes. I just, before we continue on, I just want to say to Adam, if you start another business, what size of, uh, White coat did you want with the straps on the back? I want you to punch me in the face if it looks like I'm going to do it (laughs) and stop me. (laughs) I think my wife would leave me if I started another business. So, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's just so many roadblocks to getting, we all, you know what? The three of us all know where the end game is because we've all worked on projects where the end game worked. Yeah, And we know how we got there, but how you get the big status quo, the big engine, the machine that we call the house building industry to adopt these things, on a, that's the challenge. And it starts everything from the manufacturers to codes and standards to the local inspectors to the tradespeople to the land. Of, I mean, it's everybody. Yeah. you're Well, you're from Edmonton, right? Landmark's doing well, some, some great stuff with, you know, yeah. uh, 300 and what, what did I, yeah, 395 for a net zero home. Yeah, panels on the roof, competitive to the market. They, you know, and they're a big developer. So yeah, yeah I just I, I want to go see their prefab operation. We, we, yeah, we, 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 first thing in the new year, I will be going to check that out. We got to find a way to make like the the necessary bits for net zero and sustainability, like roof panels. We got to find a way to make them sexy because realtors and estate agents they sell kitchens and bathrooms. That's what they're selling. That's it, right? So we got to get onto that list. The the cool uh, stuff. The, cool st- <laughs> the nerd stuff, let's call it. I don't mean it's yeah, cool, yeah, the yeah. nerd stuff, right? Yeah. And, and I guess the way you sell that is, you know, your electricity bill goes from X to Y, yeah. right? Funny, funny that the duplex, I live in a net zero duplex, a targeted. Right. I didn't make that thing. But our, we rent out the second half, which doesn't have the panels, but the furnace doesn't come on until November. And it wasn't the money. It was just the fact that, it, all their relatives are saying, hasn't your furnace come on yet? And, and, oh, it's not. Is it working? <laughs> it doesn't need to. And so that was the story that was the cool factor is our furnace isn't running. Everybody else is this. I, yeah. I'm, I'm really yeah. glad to hear you're living the dream in turn, not the dream, but living the example you want to be, right? By having that. That's my dream on my next house is to get into something really efficient and sustainable, even net yeah. zero. Yeah, and and you know, you um, know, Auden Schindler getting green done guy. No, I don't know. Oh, he, uh, he's into green because he's a director of sustainability at Aspen, or you know, in the right. Colorado Rockies. He right. loves powder, you know, right. and with climate change, all the powder is melting. So, so he came up to one of our conferences in Saskatoon here, and you know, our conversation is really important because his is getting green done. We need everything to be net zero, you know. Prove it out for the masses so that it is cool that yeah. everybody wants to do it. We need to go big or go home. <laughs> is, is he's the guy, I give him credit for hitting me on the head, Murray. It's not about one net zero home. They got to all be that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've had, well, Lloyd from, uh, what was it, Tree Hugger. Oh, I love that guy too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he made a really good point is that, you know, one house with solar collectors on it is 
what did you call it, Adam? Peacocking. It's peacocking. You know? It's virtue signaling. It's virtue signaling, <laughs> right? Hey, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. You know, it that's it's that's nothing. We need we need society to adopt these principles. We need scale. You know? We need Kim Kardashian to take a topless picture next to a solar panel. That's what it takes to move the needle here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there, I mean, Murray, you probably know the guys from Building Knowledge Canada, Gord Cook and Company, Andy Odin. I don't know if you know those guys or not, but, you know, the, one of their uh, partners is Great Golf Builders. And Great Golf Builders, you know, they're one of Canada's largest development companies and, and in North America. They operate on both sides of the border. But they've adopted or they're, they're looking at this active house, which is a European, mainly from Scandinavian countries where act, where passive house comes sort of from the German. Well, passive house comes from Canada, exported yeah, to Germany. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Now it's coming back again through Germany. But Great Golf you know, had a big part of their business is the prefabricated business. And they're and with their partnership with Building Knowledge Canada, Net Zero Energy Homes, that's their that's their ethos. And you can see this ethos baking in the oven. Like there's they get all the ingredients right. They're no they're understanding the processes. They're getting the lean concepts down. And a big part of that is also the marketing, the public relations, you know, the, the sequence of doing public relations, marketing and sales. You know, you, you can't jump in and get sales right away. You got to tell the story. The story is the yep. public relations part of it. And they're getting that down. Just like, Murray, you've got your public relations down, you know, people come to you because of what you've done. And so the landmark is another example. So there are examples out there. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you should bring up Lloyd because we had him out to our lean conference. He oh, was, did you? Yeah. He yeah. know, but just because of you know he had the prefab. He's an architect. He's got that's the, right. That's right. I, yeah, I, I love that guy because you know we we talked earlier about admitting when you're wrong. You know, <laughs> and he basically wrote a really interesting. Actually, I have his card sitting right here. <laughs> Wait, just little, little there tiny. he is. Yeah. There, there he is. And yeah. and Boyd wrote an article. All we thought we know about passive design is probably wrong. And yeah. because you know the the first. Passive house in Regina, it, they didn't have big windows to capture the light. I have to open my doors to let the heat out. And Lloyd nailed it. You know, we can build net zero homes on any orientation. We, yeah. We've got too scientific about this passive, everything needs to face south. All developers can't face all their property south. No. We can net zero any direction. And yeah. Lloyd yeah. really is smart that way. Yeah. Actually, so for, for our listeners, Lloyd yeah. was episode... I can't remember what the episode it was. I'll put it in the show notes, but we called Lloyd's episode. His name is Lloyd Alter and he's from treehugger.com. Don't be put off by that name. He's not a social no. justice warrior by any means. <laughs> and um, he's, we titled his episode The Case Against Net Zero because he gave a very compelling case against net zero without shitting on the green movement or, you know, dumbing down anything. It was a really interesting take. As you say, you can be wrong, you can be right, and you can have different opinions, right? But ultimately, yeah. it's about making a change, get into more efficient homes, and get into more sustainable solutions. Right. And so is he basically saying that there's a sweet spot in yeah. efficiency that might not be to net zero? And that's what we're finding, you know, that yeah, to get to passive level costs, you know, an extra premium that most people might not want to pay. Yeah, and he's, yeah. he was being a bit more um, philosophical macro on that. He was saying, to just use less, yeah. right? He, he, he's the one who coined the term for me, you know, uh, net zero is peacocking. It's, it's virtue signaling. It's like driving your Tesla down the road and chucking $10 bills out the window, you know? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> now there's, you know, I don't, I love Tesla, so I have an ambition to have one one day, but he had a really interesting point. And uh, we got a few comments on that, the case against Net Zero, because once people didn't like it, they found it really hard to knock it down. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he also, if you remember, he was also talking about scale again. Yes, that was one his house thing. Is, one house is not what we need. You know, we need entire developments that yes. are built on these principles, you know. And they they can't they don't need to be four thousand square foot net zero that they why can't they be right. yeah, more right. yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. I mean my wife and I uh, you know my kids are leaving home our next house will be a downsize so we really looked hard at you know what we need and it doesn't maximum it comes to two thousand square foot right yeah. most yuppies yeah. in the suburbs in Canada live in three thousand four thousand square foot homes right yeah well, we're down fourteen fifty yeah. <laughs> so, 
So, yeah. you know, it's 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 interesting take and there's no right answer here, right? But Lloyd's point, which was the, the big takeaway for me, was things happen at scale. Yeah. And yeah. that's what you gotta get to. And that starts with telling a story, a good story about why and what's happening. You gotta tell them the why, then you gotta tell them the how. Yeah. And then somehow you gotta convince that on scale. So no problem, right? Easy stuff. Lloyd also <laughs> said he was he was talking about architects who lived long enough to see some of their buildings destroyed on purpose. Yeah. The rubble the rubble club they call it. The rubble club. <laughs> yeah, you're not a true architect until you've seen your if you until you're a member of the rubble club. Now you know? we are coming up on an hour here, Murray. We like to keep it to an hour, and I want to be respectful okay. of your time. But we do have some quick fire questions we ask all our guests. There's no wrong answers, but there's no phone a friend. So. Relax, loosen up, and I will ask you the first question. And it's okay. a subject dear to my heart. So we, I always like to imagine, you know, uh, we're aiming the show at graduates or young engineers or undergraduates who are sort of not sure where they want to go in the industry and, you know, trying to give them some advice on some of their early steps. So what advice would you give to a woman in STEM looking to move and have a career in the built environment industry? I, t- I tell us from any – when I graduated – I wanted to be a controls guy. And I just, I knew what I, if you know what you want and you walk in the door and talk to a business owner and show that you're passionate about it and that you just didn't come there for a job and you ask enough people enough times, they will hire you and you will get to do what you're passionate about. And if you're going to make a difference in the world, you got to be passionate about something. And so that's what I would tell them. Don't give up. If you know what you want, your likelihood of getting a job is going to be so much higher. Yeah, and, and go for a career, not a job, right? That's great advice for anyone. Yeah. Long term. Yeah, and and search out. You know, with nowadays with the internet, you can find people in groups or searching words that have some thinking that your skills will be of value to. And uh, you know, it's really hard to find people that with integrative thinking and a passion for net zero and all those things. So you know, it's hard to find people. So if that's what you want to do, you will find a job. Yeah, agreed. So between the three of us, we probably have over 800 years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> if you had some advice for parents today, you know, that are 32 years old, they've got an eight-year-old kid, a 10-year-old kid, degree or a trade ticket? <laughs> That's an interesting, yeah. You know, I love the way they celebrate the trades in Germany And, you you know, my son's a tradesman. He had a hard time fitting in the boxes of school just from, you know, he's not ADD, but, you know, taking a kid, putting him in a classroom and expecting him to be prepared for university. So I, I, I think there needs to be more paths that are celebrated and not felt as second class citizens in the trades because and trades, you have such an opportunity to create business. You know, an electrician, a, a carpenter, you, you know, it's easier to create a business there than it is an engineering company, I think. So, yeah, I, my, I totally agree with you on that. I'll say here now on the record, I know more millionaire plumbers than I know millionaire lawyers, doctors, accountants, economists, yeah, politicians, whatever. If you get a trade ticket and you like what you do and you're smart enough to know that you're either a businessman running a trade company or you're a trades guy that owns a trade company, but you're smart enough to hire a business manager so that it's run as a professional business, you will make money hand over fist. Yeah. There's such a shortage of good trades. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, Robert, that's a great question. You got to ask that every time because for me, (laughs) I, I... I have a son similar to you, Murray, where my son's just not right for university and I'm hoping he's going to become an apprentice electrician this year, actually. But my advice to anyone is if you're doing a degree, only do a degree that leads to a licensed profession because a licensed profession is a monopoly situation and you earn a certain amount of money. If you're not doing that, then the trade route is, in my opinion, the way to go because yeah. you're, you're learning skills that society is willing to pay for, come good or bad economy. You know, and I personally believe the future, when, when we were all starting work, the future belonged to bankers and financialization, right? We didn't know that at the time, but 30 years on, 37 years on, <laughs> that's what it is. I personally believe the future belongs to farmers and artisans because the financialization, even a lot of engineers, standard engineering stuff is going to get automated. 
And that's going to leave the creative class to make the difference. And they're the people that will make the money or the providers of essential services like agriculture will make money, right? 11 billion people coming down the pipe, that's not going away. So, you know, if you're teetering on the edge, my advice is always go down the trade route. Yeah. And one of the things about the trade route is that if you get, if you, at least if you get your ticket, you'll always have some way to put food on the table. Maybe you'll figure out that, you know, after five or six years in the field that, you know what, the academic route has an appeal to me, but I've got a whole bunch of field experience. And when you decide, maybe you go to, maybe it, maybe it's not university, maybe it's one of the polytechniques, right? Maybe you, maybe you go to a NAID or a SAID or, or a SIA, what is it, SIA, SIAS in uh, Saskatoon? It, it was SIAS, but then they changed the name, SAS Polytech now, I think. SAS Polytech, right? Yeah. You know, so... And Adam, we were talking about that earlier, you know, people that we would hire out of school for our practices, if they had field experience, they were way more valuable way than the better. guy that had no, oh, yeah, way right? Better. Yeah. So, you know, if they get, if you got kids and they just, the academic route is not their thing, the trades is a way to make a great living. And then you always have the opportunity later on, if you want to go back to school, you yeah. can. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And mix mix some arts in there to get the other side of the brain going. Absolutely, just in there to yeah. to get the entrepreneur spirit going. And uh, yeah, and and go go to anytime I go to a big uh, trade show or I, I you know all the I come out of there so energized with I can start a business a week or a day. <laughs> comes out. You, whenever you go to a, a conference or something, just go find out what other people are doing and you will become energized and something will fall in your lap, I'm sure. Yeah. If not a job. <laughs> <Because Yeah. there's, laughs> Good advice. People. Good advice. I have one last question I have for you. Maybe Adam, you have another one. You've seen a lot of buildings in your career. All Are most of them touched by some form of uh, architectural profession? Architects in school today are going to be the practitioners designing buildings in the future. What words of advice do you have for them in terms of the direction of architecture over the next 20, 30 years that they should be paying attention to? Oh, <laughs> that's a, a tough. Um, well, the, the, pers- the person that comes to mind is Shafraz at Manzik Isaac, mm. who embraced lean to do that mosaic center in Edmonton there. You know, he's a, a techie, he's he's open to collaboration with construction and it's just way, way more fun. We need to get out of our silos. So architecture, if you're going in there, learn how to collaborate with the whole team. We used to call it master builder approach. You know, go that way. It, it's just way more fun, way more efficient. And uh, so- yeah. That's a, you know, that's a theme that we hear over and over again, right, Adam? Yep, absolutely. Get out of your silos, play on the team. Yeah. It's not a hierarchy. It's a flat organization that makes these buildings work. Lean helps, right? Yeah, and don't be scared of losing your, you know, I think, you know, the pedestal or the, you know, we, we need to get beyond that. Just be comfortable in this, what you bring to the team. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the point, okay. yeah. Yeah, so that's I, good. Flat. You don't have to be a genius, right? You just have to do your bit well, right? That's, yeah. the, that's the thing. So just one final question for me. Are you pessimistic or optimistic for the future in our industry? I, I have to be optimistic. I do. I've got Jackson, William Bell, just born on November 14th, and 11 billion people on the planet. You, got, you need energy to make these changes. I'm optimistic. Good. And uh, Paul Hanley wrote that book. We know the tech. We know what we need to do. The tech, and we don't even need to invent anything for 11 billion people to live on this planet by the year 2100. We just need to do it. So Amen. I'm optimistic that we're there's enough stuff happening that we're going to figure it out. But we got to do the big leaps like we're talking about. I agree. It's not a technology yeah. problem. It's a thinking problem. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. And thank, thanks for having me to be able to talk about that kind of thing today. (laughs) (laughs) That's been our pleasure, Murray. Yeah, Murray, thank you for coming on. It's been awesome. I've been tracking you like a little psychopath for a while now, and I like what you're putting out there. (laughs) Thanks for tracking me down. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, you know, what keeps coming to my mind is Murray's got to write a book about this. Get this 
this story <laughs> out there in a concise, digestible way and then go on the road with it. That's what you got to do. Sell your business, get yourself okay, into a hey, place and I, then I, get that this, book written. Okay, I've, all, I've already written the first chapters. It's called The Scrawny Pirate Project Playbook. Just do just <laughs> this. I got rid of the word lean and called it scrawny. Pirates steal from the the rich to give to the net zero and uh so that's uh, it, it's all it's in the works okay yeah. so when you get that written we'll have you back on and we'll, we'll do everything we can to put that message out there okay sounds great yeah Thank you. chapter two should be uh, avoiding uh tender trauma <laughs> okay. I'll get you to come into my <laughs> Awesome. All right. All right, Mark. Thank you very much. It's been great. Okay. Cheers. Thank nice you. Chance. Well, that was Murray. I, I enjoyed that. I came away optimistic, actually, <laughs> at the end of that, and smiling uh, to myself, as you are now. <laughs> it was a great question you asked him, and his answer is How could you not get enthusiastic about that? Yeah. You know? I mean, you could ask a thousand people that same question, but until you take ownership of your role in earth stewardship, yeah. it's meaningless to you. He he embraces everything that the term earth stewardship is all about with his grandchild. Yeah. You know, he's not advocating his, his uh, responsibility for the future of the planet. He's saying, no, it's my job now, today, this minute right now is my job to make sure that my grandkid has a decent place to live in the future. Isn't and the way we're doing shit now, that ain't going to happen unless I become part of the solution. There's nothing I have in children or grandchildren to give you a long-term perspective, right? Because there's a lot of philosophy around this and religion around this, but, you know, it's your immortality, right? Yeah. Your children, your children's children, and their children's children. That's immortality, I believe, yeah. right? I'm not necessarily a religious guy. I don't even know what I am. But it really concerns me how things are for my children and their children's children. Yeah, That's one of the reasons I moved to Canada. It's a great place. It's a great place to bring up kids. And the future in Canada, despite the government's best efforts, is uh, <laughs> is promising, I believe, right? Yeah. And, you know... But you can't, as you say, you can't be in a silo. It's everybody's problem. It's not everybody's and nobody's problem, right? So Murray yeah. lives in Canada, which is an awesome place. He's got everything going for him, and yet he's still in the fight, right, to move the needle and make things better. It's yeah. just way too easy to sit back and be happy with your lot. Yeah. Sometimes I disgust myself when I do that, <laughs> and I, that's why I like speaking to people like Murray because they get me fired up to be better. It's, I've been through major change, as you know, major changes in my life. And I've downsized, you know, when my wife passed away and I sold the house and we got rid of all of the big toys. You know, I went from a big house in a beautiful part of Calgary into a more conservative place. And I got to tell you, Adam, it's a treat. I don't have to worry about painting and plumbing and electrical issues. And when I, and you know, we both travel a lot huh? when I go away. You know, I, I walk away. Yeah. There's a lot to be said about that. I because I don't drive a lot. I I don't own. I used to own a big truck. I'll admit that I owned one of the biggest trucks that Ford made. It was an excursion. Of course, shame you did. on you're from Alberta. <laughs> shame on me. <laughs> but now I drive a ten year old Honda CRV. It's only it's ten years old. It's only got 130 k on it. But it's all I need to zip around here and there. Everything else I got around me, I can walk. Lloyd Alter would he would kiss me on the cheek for the way I'm living. <laughs> you know, it's a utopia, and it's a really nice way of living. I can walk to everywhere I need to go to groceries, to entertainment, restaurants, whatever. The dry cleaner, whatever. You know, it's a nice way to live. It's simple. Was it hard to make that jump down? Yeah, it was nice to be a hedonistic. <laughs> But, it, but, you know, I started, and and just for those that maybe don't know, I mean, I had a house. We had the snow melt systems. We had we had all the toys. We had hot tubs and pools. And, and I would just look at, I would, some days I would come back and I would see the steam coming off my driveway. And I would go, how can I be out on the road talking about sustainability, you know, high performance <laughs> construction. And here I am melting snow off my driveway, you know. Yeah, it just became a, walk. no, I'm not walking the walk. It was a, it was definitely a conflict. But I resolved that. Was it hard? Yeah. You know what it was? It was ego. It was it was saying, what's more important here, my ego or the future of this planet? And I made a decision that 
it's okay to be conservative. It's okay to live a life that's, you know, with that's a basic life. I have everything I need here. It's a beautiful place I'm in, right? But it's small, it's affordable, it's, you know, it's yeah. I he going back to our guest, the savings that they're able to pull out of a project is phenomenal. Yeah. Why is that a secret to everyone? I don't understand. No kidding. <laughs> No kidding. We had an expletive deleted moment there for a second. You know, it was like, why the, are we not like, what's the secret? Like, let's get that out there. Yeah. It wasn't a, it wasn't a conservative number. What was he talking? It was like big numbers, 18% on design and up to 40 on construction. But all right. If you even got 10% shaved off construction on a $38 million job, no one gets fired for that, right? No, (laughs) no, they don't. Yeah. You know, it's insane. It always fascinates me because it's always about people and human interactions at the end of the day, right? And yeah. everyone's agendas and culture, and you know, culture is the aggregate of everything, right? The nonsense, the laws, yeah. everything. And despite sometimes very obvious and defensible positions, they're not adopted. Right? Yeah, it's, it's. I don't know. It's you know, it's going to be a bit like. We look back a hundred years and see what our forefathers were doing. You think, God, they were gross. They were animals, right? Yeah. They didn't have plumbing. They were dirty. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then a hundred years from now, people are going to look back on us and go, factory farming, what were they thinking? Sustainability, what were they thinking? Right? Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. I guess it's it's evolution. But the other, going back to, to your story of your downsides, you know, the other thing that people have their hard time getting their head around High density cities are sustainable because there's less car movements. Everyone can walk to where they need to go. Yeah. There's a, you know, there's public transport. There's a lot of efficiencies in that. Somehow making like the New Yorks, the Torontos, the downtown Calgary's more livable, I think is the answer. Because in the absence of industrialization or the deindustrialization of the West, you're getting knowledge jobs, right? And people are clustering around cities now. If you want to make money or have a career, you've got to be in a city. That's it, right? Yeah. Or you've got to be a digital nomad, and there's not enough of them. So, you know, the sweet spot is, I think, if you're a planning in a planning office in a in a municipality, is how do you make, how do you get high quality, high density urban housing, so people yeah. don't need their cars, right? Because yeah. you've experienced the benefits of that. And people who live in New York have been living that benefit for a while. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, and and this, you and I have traveled a lot. And traveling gives us experiences that other people don't get if they don't travel. Now, I just came back from Italy. There are (laughs) places like Florence and Pisa were all built around roadways that you could never get a big American truck down. (laughs) Yeah. You better you know, get a Fiat Uno down some of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, and everybody walks everywhere. Yep. And if you're not walking, you're on a motorcycle. And if you're not on a motorcycle, you know, you're on a rickshaw. You yep. know, the this concept of thousands of cars that were built to travel at 180 kilometers an hour, but get stuck in traffic jams doing 10 kilometers an hour. You know, it just doesn't it just doesn't happen there in these in these high density cities. Yeah. Florence is a great example. Milan is another one. You know, the and what's beautiful about that, and Lloyd Alter talks about this all the time, you know, about what happens to society when you get rid of the cars and you have pedestrian traffic and you have yeah. the bicycles, right? And it brings communities together. And it's all about the shops and the socializing and the fresh food and you know they they live a wonderful life in Italy. Yeah, I was thinking also come to mind was Singapore. That's possibly an example of a high quality of life, high density situation, right? Mm-hmm. So there's great public transport. It's cheap, affordable. There's also greenery because that's mandated by planning laws. But there's also a lot of people living very closely together, not killing each other just living their lives, you know, yeah. sort of reasonably high quality, certainly a very high Western. I mean, it's, New York is is nowhere near as good as Singapore <laughs> in terms of quality yeah. of life, right? Yeah. Or, so, Denmark. or Denmark. Other, yeah. yeah. So, right? you know, there are examples, but 
they're outliers at the moment. I, yeah. I think, and again, housing is a cultural phenomenon, right? As I right. found when I moved from the UK to Canada. Yeah. You know, an Englishman does not live in a wood house with a felt roof. My dog does that. <laughs> right? So in Canada, everybody lives in a wood house with a felt roof, which was horrific when I first got here. But now I'm on board with it because it's culturally what happens here, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know. There's There's so much... There's so many good ideas out there and so much good thinking. Somehow we've got to get it coalesced into some action and some planning. Maybe planning like municipal planning departments. They yeah. could be drivers for this. Remember what Saeed Alaba said when we interviewed him? He said most of the action on sustainability is happening at the municipal level. Right. They're yeah. the people making a difference. They're pushing the agenda. Yeah. You see that in California with some of their leadership on sustainability. Right. Yeah. Maybe that's the answer. Because there's the wriggle room, right? The, yeah. The spotlight's on the guy on the federal level, not the guy at the municipal level. So that guy yeah. at the municipal level or gal can do the sexy stuff, do the different thing, take the risk. Yeah. Don't know. So how do you as a self-admitted liberal pro-market, free market individual deal with the socialistic side that this – I'm, I'm so confusing, right? So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a libertarian who believes in social health care. I'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative all the way through, right? Yeah, yeah. I've got more liberal views than most. Like I believe in legalizing all drugs. Yeah. I, I say no funding for religious schools of any. They shouldn't be able to go to a Catholic school. Why am yeah. I paying for that? Or any other school for that matter, right? That, so I've got all that going on. Confuses the hell out of my friends because they, they have a real hard <laughs> trouble putting me in a pigeonhole. But for me, it comes to a few things. Freedom of speech, freedom of movement, property rights, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the freedom to live your life and do the best you can. And this is, these are almost American concepts, right? But there's a lot of concepts there that I live in a free country. I'm going to do whatever the hell I bloody well want. <laughs> yeah, so you know, this is why I'm, gonna, I'm not a real libertarian because I don't believe in uh, no laws. Like, I wouldn't get rid of the FDA. There's, there's some for me. If I was like at a governmental level, it's about risk management, right? So some things are so risky, like healthcare, they need yeah. to be socialized, right? Yeah. And even if you're an employer, having that healthcare socialized has to be better for you, right? Because there's a risk taken off the table from a key employee. Who might sure there is. Yeah. Go, yeah. go down the toilet, right? Other things like that, like sort of common goods, are like uh, police, army, right? There's such yeah. big risks, they have to be socialized. So yeah. there's a sort of risk reward calculation there. That's not, for me, I don't think that's a political thing. That's an economic thing, yeah. right? Yeah. But they're all heavily politicized things as well, as it turns out, which is yeah. why I'm not king for the day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have, I'm a very strange person. But, you know, for me, <laughs> freedoms, the, the basic freedoms and the basic rule of law and the ability to just live your life and seek the best life you can. Those are the fundamentals for me. Yeah. But in that seek the best life you can, there are consequences to that. Yeah. but and Because I don't you think, might do that at the expense of, and this is the social side, you might be doing that at the expense of somebody else. Yeah. So this is where the rule of law comes in, right? So you can't yeah. be an asshole, right? You've got to respect... So you got to do, live the best life you can. We could go so any, many places with that statement. Yeah, but you can't you do can't, harm to others, right? you got to do, be the best you can, live the best life you can without harming others. Because that's yeah. when you become an asshole and you're an externality to someone. And that's yeah. not acceptable. That's what laws are for, right? Yeah. And, and that's that's sort of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of sustainability. Yes. You know, if you and for those that maybe don't quite understand that statement, you take 100 people in a desert and you give them a gallon of water. Who gets the water? You have you got elderly people, you got infants, and in between there you've got middle-aged people. Hmm. Some are healthy, some aren't. Some are going to die, right? Who gets the water, right? And we have resources, you know, on the planet. Some people use more of those resources than others. And I think there's a lot of deep thought that needs to go into those allocation of resources and, and of the concept of fair, what's reasonable. Yeah. We seem to have lost that, you know? Yeah, I, th I think what's going on with the interconnectedness driven by the growth in population, there's a leveling going on, mm. right? And that basically means the West has to do learn to – use less and developing countries have want and 
should have more, but they, so it's on us in the West to use less responsibly and hopefully not, not devolve quality of life. And it's also on developing countries to, as they develop to, this is all my opinion, by the way, to use more in a responsible way, right? All right. I know people in the West had a head start and they were horrible with some of their resources. That, sure. That's done. Yeah. It's sunk. Whatever you yeah. feel about it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, the future doesn't care about your feelings. It cares about the future. Correct. So, you know, th- there's a leveling that's going on over a period of time where as developed countries learn to live more sustainable and developing countries learn to grow more sustainably, and then hopefully there's an equilibrium that gets reached at some point. But that yeah. requires a lot of cooperation and laws yeah. that are respected and not, you know, that, that's where crony and corruptionism doesn't work. Because the laws yeah. have to apply to everyone, right? So again, we're in some deep, deep stuff here. Murray, yeah, yeah. I apologize for this. You got me off my rant. <laughs> but um, going back to he, Murray, he um, he answered. He had some good responses to our uh, fast questions, you know, in terms of women and uh, parents and uh, architects. I liked his his reply. Well, on the parent one was really good for the architects. Don't be afraid to leave your pedestal behind. And I bet if he kept talking to her, he would probably say, don't build a pedestal in the first place. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that, yeah, I like that. And I loved, I loved his answer on the trades because that, for me, is always, has been a fascinating thing. So I've got one, one child who's been through university or two have been through university and one's probably going to go down the trade route. Yeah. Uh, my old professor used to say, you know, what he used to say? D stu- a students work for D students in the world, right? So A students yeah. are very compliant and they get engineering degrees and they become professional engineers and they do good work and they earn good money. But the people that make the money, money, the big money, are the C and D students who have to get out there and take a risk. Yeah. That was his saying. He says, you know, all you A students, lap it up because you're going to be working for them guys at the back one day. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, and that's uh, someone that, that was another saying that, you know, those that are wearing the suits and ties are working for the guys wearing the flip-flops and T-shirts. Yeah. So true, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you look at all those guys that that are you know that that are down in the south on holidays, and they're they're just you know enjoying the rewards of of their labor. And uh, a lot of those guys down there were twisting wrenches, hammering nails, you know, welding stuff up. If you don't, if I had my time again, I'd be a licensed plumber. Yeah, I'd go home on time. I'd charge exorbitant rates and I just, I think I'd have a, I've got a great quality of life, don't get me wrong, but my life could almost probably be enhanced by that if I'd have had that time again, I think. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not got any regrets. Love my life. Yeah, I, me too. I, you know, I was very fortunate because I started out in the trades and, yeah. uh, and I actually miss, sometimes I miss those days because there was, you know, you were in such great shape. You know, those, the trades guys that took care of themselves, yeah. you know, where they were, and my son, my youngest son, he would call themselves, you know, industrial athletes. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because that's what they are. They're industrial yeah. athletes. The physical work that they do uh, from the time that they show up on the job site to the time they go home, it's the training that an athlete would get. You're lifting stuff. You're, you know, like you're just your mobility, your abilities to, to move. On a, on a job site, you know what it's like. And when you get onto a big project, it's it's like a great big gym set. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 You're climbing up and down stairs. You're getting into elevators on the side of a building. You know, it's just you're jumping over stuff. You, you know, it's just. At my age, yeah. in my late 50s, you know, if I was still plumbing, I'd be probably a bit fitter than I am now. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, so, but the guys that, that, that take care of themselves and then ultimately a lot of those guys, you know, they become, uh, they end up having people work for them, but they still, their minds are still active. Hmm. You know, I know guys that, that have uh, sold their businesses to their sons or daughters, Yeah, but they're still active in the business. They're still playing the mentor role. I mean, some of these guys are 65, 70 years old. They, they, they don't, they're retired, but they're not retired from life. Yeah. So there's great yeah. health benefits to work in. But there's bad health benefits to working under stress 80 hours a week, right? There is a right. balance there. Yeah. And like someone like Murray, when he does sell his business and retire, he needs to do something. He's not that guy who can sit back. And I'm sure he no, will. He'll write yeah. that book. He'll do something. He's got yeah, value yeah. to add, right? Yeah, That's, sure he does. That is an example of a good way to go out. I like yeah. that. Yeah, me too. 
So mm-hmm. on that note, I think we should wrap up. So we're getting very philosophical here. I shall put a note. <laughs> I shall put a note in the show notes that you and I got super philosophical at the end and <laughs> tell people to get their bath bucket out. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here at first. Okay, man. Yeah. That was awesome. I'll see you on the next one. <laughs> Thanks, man. See ya. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. See you next time.